So today we're doing rodentia, which is a study of the rodents. Uh, so I'm going to do rodentia followed up with lagomorpha. I will not get to lagomorpha today, but these two are very similar groups. So the you if in your computers you should, you got the thing you got the thing. Got the thing. Okay, okay. So rodents and uh, I like this lecture because it's a lot of my pictures. In there, so. Okay. so the name rodera comes from Ganaw. They are Ganaars. I always think it's bad we don't pronounce that G. So Ganaw, Ganat. Anyway, so yes, this is this is a chipmunk here. Okay. Without a doubt, these are this is the this is the biggest group of mammals. There are more rodents than any other order at all. Uh, second place is going to be the bats. We haven't got to that yet. So uh, we don't know people well, aren't really rodents we, makes perfect sense. Sure, there'd be lots of them. But bats being next always kind of is people a little weird. I would have always thought of the cardiovascular. Okay, so these aren't these are just numbers to let you know how big things are. 15, I'm not going to ask exactly how many species they are, but there are 30 families. Uh, needless to say, I want, to, I want you to know some of these families, but definitely not all 30. Some of them we've already mentioned, and some of them are kind of really, really important. Without a doubt, the two biggest groups are the, are the mice and rats. And what I mean that, these are Muridae is mice and rats. Crocidae is mice and rats. Okay, these are uh, Muridae are often referred to as the old world mice and rats, and that's the big group. And Crocidae are often referred to as the new world mice and rats. Having said that, they both are in the old world. They're both in the new world. So it's uh, kind of weird. For the longest time, they were all the same family, Muridae. And, uh, and sometimes when you read about uh, the things, people will slap them back together. Just to let you know that things can be confusing understanding these families. Okay, so some of the characteristics of of this group here. Well, first of all, where are they found? Everywhere except sort of interesting Antarctica. We expect that. We know that Antarctica doesn't have any mammals at all. New Zealand doesn't have any of these native. Well, native again. Having said that, and then a lot of the islands of Oceania. <coughs> That's native, okay? Now they're everywhere. The reason for that is a couple of these species are commensal with humans. Specifically, why I picked three species, Rattus ratus, Rattus norwegicus, and Musmusmus. Those are all murids, and they're all uh, uh, hook up with humans pretty well. Where are the most of them? The most of them uh, are in, uh, the greatest amount, number of species are in the neotropical region, and not only the greatest diversity in species, but also the greatest diversity in morphology. Some really weird differences down there uh, of, of, of the rodents. I did that. I just did all these slides here. Okay, there we go. Back to where here. Skull characteristics. What skull is that? Beaver. Okay, yeah, by now it should be second nature. This is the one you've all seen before. Beaver, is, of course, is the largest rodent in North America. So it makes a nice, easy skull to take pictures of and do things with. Okay. We already know a lot of these sort of things because we've done dentition, skull work. So beavers are one one. All, all of the of the rodents are one one on the incisors. One pair upper, one pair lower. Then you get to the canines. Okay. Well, yeah. The other thing about these is is how sharp they are. Okay. I think we talked a little bit about this. Uh, of course, uh, if you look at them, they, they, they never grow. This tooth, the upper tooth, basically goes up through the nasal cavity and it comes all the way back to here. This one goes all the way and runs right up through the mandible up to here. They're, they're rootless. There's no root at the end of it. They're flat. And it constantly grows. So they, as a result, you know, rodent means gnaw. And it means gnaw for a reason. These things must, must, must chew. If they don't, they'll die. Okay. The beavers, you'll notice all of all rodents have two different types of enamel. It's really clear on evident on a beaver because the dark, the front enamel is very, very dark, very orange, and the back enamel is white. And they are of different strength of hardness. The front enamel is much harder than the back enamel. So 
as a result, when they gnaw, the back wears out first, which keeps this wonderfully sharpened beveled edge on the front. So that's they always have very sharp teeth just because of the way they wear. No canines, we just have this big open area. What's that big open area between the canines and the premolars called? Just a tema? Just it starts with a D. No, it's pretty close. In fact, diastema. diastema. That's the diastema. So between here, so there's no, so the rip, so basically the, the have what are left are premolars and molars, hence the cheek teeth, as we call them, uh, on the sides there. And uh, their molars, uh, and all the rodents are very flat topped. They're grinders. So, all right, so they chew things off and, and break things down. Great for seed eating, great for all sorts of plant and breaking down plant matter. Size range some of these are really, really tiny. And some of these are pretty darn big. Okay. So the biggest, without a doubt, is capybara, which is sort of an interesting animal. Have we talked about capybara? Anybody talk about capybara in this class? I haven't mentioned it at all. Oh, I love this, especially this time of year. I, this is the week to talk about capybara. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I sometimes just please myself. OK, OK. So this is, yeah, so you look at this thing, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, it's big, it's big. It's because there's no scale in there. Let's use a scale, a human being, okay? This is big, okay? Now, why do I get all excited about capybara? What do we know about this week? What makes this week different than any other week of the year? Let's see, let's see, nothing to do with science. Good Friday? Good Friday, this is Holy Week, okay? That's what it's known as, Holy Week, okay? So. Are we still wondering what the hell this has to do with capybara? Yes. Excuse me, Dr. Grubo, what the hell does this have to do with capybara? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> capybara, are they a mammal? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so far we're looking good. Okay, all right. So when it comes to, so we are, this is the last week of Lent. What do you know about Lent? Never heard of it. It's in all the papers. No one ever heard about Lent. What do you know about Lent? No. Don't you give things up for Lent? You tend to give things up for Lent, right. Okay. If you're Catholic, what do you must you give up? Mm -hmm. Well, no. We, 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 we have to give up meat on Fridays. Okay? Mm. So you cannot eat mammals on Friday except one. The cat. Okay, the proper term is what's up with that, Joel? Okay. 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 So, capybara are in, where are they from? They're from South America, right? Okay, so, you know the connection with the Catholic Church in South America? The conquistadors, okay? So, basically, they were over there in South America back in the 1700s destroying everything they could to try to get gold. Of course, they're sending it back to the church. At that time, the Cortez, Pizarro, all the others say, yeah, it's great to be over here, but my men are starving to death. It's Friday, we need meat. And they said, well, find something over there that we've never seen before, and we'll declare it clear. They found, we got this thing called a capybara. That's it, that's legal. <laughs> never heard of it. So that's why capybara is the only mammal that you can eat on Good Friday. So, so there. So well, on, on all Fridays of Lent, especially for well, Good Friday, you can't eat anything. Else. So, so there's your ecclesiastical lesson for the day. <coughs> I, I'll go on. Anyway, more pictures. So, yeah, anyway, it's a big animal. It's got a good chunk of meat on it. So, do you think it's weird to eat rodents? Not as long as it tastes good. Yeah, I've had beaver meat, and it's it's pretty good. It beaver is pretty stew. good. Yeah. So that's a big rodent too, so I guess it's not all that weird. The littlest one is the pygmy gerboa. That's it. So you can see it's like, it, it's just so cute. Now the little critter looks like it fell off a charm bracelet. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's so you, you get a big difference in size. Okay, other characteristics, diet. Generally, if you think about those big flat teeth, it's granivory. It's getting awful dark, isn't it? You've been watching? Yeah. Okay, keep watching, I trust you. 
Okay. You're, you're a little bit more sensitive than the rest of the people I know about this and stuff. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, so, so, so they're grain eaters. We've all seen the fact that squirrels. What sort of squirrel is this? Gray squirrel. Nope. That's a fox squirrel. Yeah. Too reddish. Okay. So, uh, so they're, you know, they, of course, they're eating apple, eating and apple, and that's great. Okay. But they'll also eat fruits and vegetative matter. I watched this guy basically eat all this plant up here. Anybody know who that is? Groundhog. Groundhog. Okay. Actually, this wasn't a groundhog. This was a woodchuck. Why do I say that? Because I was in Pennsylvania at the time. They call them woodchucks up there. We call them the proper name, groundhog. However, having said that, many of them, the commensals, the ones that live around humans, are omnivorous. They'll pretty much eat anything. They're commensals, so they eat what we eat. And so they, they don't care. I see squirrels, too. If you haven't ever seen a squirrel with a chicken bone, you, you're missing something in your life. They love chickens. So, so you, you know, oftentimes you'll find squirrels outside of churches or, or uh, Popeyes or something like that, working its way down through the chicken bone. In fact, I should, uh, uh, bones, I, I don't know if I can cover this later, bones, whenever you go, if, you, if you're out in the world and you're looking for bones in the woods, you'll often find them gnawed up. Okay. And uh, rodents will be gnaw on bones, and oftentimes you find antlers, the sheds we call them, they'll be gnawed up. And they gnaw for two different reasons. One is calcium tends to be a limiting factor in terrestrial systems. The other two is they got to gnaw. They have to gnaw. Okay. Always, if you see the signs on the trees on campus, uh, they, if you look at them, they're all chewed off. And I've had people ask me, now what nutrients are they getting from that? They're not getting a nutrient. They just got to gnaw. That's all they have to do. They just like to chew. Okay. So that brings up, okay, we'll talk about, so a lot of these are, are commensals. So I want to talk about some of the associations of rodents and humans. There's a strong connection between the two. Okay. Uh, in many cases, they're detrimental. I'll come back and talk about this again. Uh, so we think of them as pest species. This is this is rat damage here. With the, with the came through the wall. Okay. So they chew on things. Also, they will bite you. They're very with their very sharp teeth. Spiky, picky. Uh, so lots of destruction, things that they'll do, tear things up. Uh, they are a disease vector. So those of you who are in my medical and uh, veterinary entomology class, we talk about them as a reservoir host. But there's a number of different diseases, little things like the plague, antivirus. Okay. So but in that class, we don't talk about antivirus because it doesn't have an insect involved in this life. But the plague does. The plague, of course, goes to fleas. All sorts of diseases that these guys will carry. Other thing about them is they're simply, some people think they're, who does not like rodents? That's quite all right. It's, it makes sense, okay? I can't say as I'm overly choked up about it. But they have some beneficial aspects, too. And in my family, some of them are kind of important. Okay, so some, so a lot of these are fur bearers and or sources for leather. So they're a commodity. Uh, not they aren't as much as a commodity as they used to be. Uh, it, there was back in my misspent youth, we trapped beaver for to, we could sell the hides. Nowadays they trap beavers because they're a nuisance animal and they don't really sell the hides. So like, this is a beaver coat, what it would look like. Okay, this is what nutria looks like. A nutria is invasive species. It was brought here uh, to, to uh, ranch or raise. It's called ranch raising. Well, but they do with mink. You raise it up, and then you slaughter them out and do this sort of thing. But of course, they, got, they escaped uh, captivity and they got loose. So, nutria, also known as coital. Okay. Capybara is also is often used for le leather. And uh, they usually don't call it cap, they call it carpincho leather. In case you ever see that name. Big <coughs> they are a major base on the food chain for lots of different things. Pretty much what animals, anything with 
pretty much all sorts of things eat uh, uh, rodents. Uh, carnivora eats rodents, um, snakes, a lot of the birds of prey, the raptors will eat them. So uh, it's, it's kind of an important food source. And if you, if we find these species desirable, like people like barn owls. So when you eat rodents, or barn owls. Other things, this is a big one, of course, in my family, both of my, both of my kids are researchers, both have their doctoral degrees, and they do research, and their model organism are white mice. They work white. Son works on uh, diseases, uh, diseases like uh, the plague, and so he works with them. My daughter works with diseases of the eyes, and so she works with, so they both are, they, they go through a lot of rats, and they go through a lot of mice. Okay, so where was this picture taken? Anybody know? Kenton. There we go. She knew the exact town I was at. Okay. Kenton is a town that's close to here, which is famous for its white squirrel population. This is not an albino. How do you know that? It doesn't have, red it doesn't have the pinkish eyes, exactly. So, yeah, so this is, this is one of Kenton. So, so isn't that amazing a squirrel could be that white? Check that one out, okay? This, this is a black squirrel, in case you Okay, these, uh, is a, when my daughter got her doctoral degree in New York City, uh, Fordham University, they had a big population of black squirrels on, on their uh, property here. And I worked forever to try to get the very same picture to it. I thought I did okay. Okay, first group here, here's a name that's sort of been Aplodontides, but sort of weaving its way through and in and out of this class you're probably sick of hearing about aplodonity, but you hear it is again. Aplodonity is a rodent. Right? That's the mouth beaver, and we know that it's, it's actually closely related to the. To, it's not closely related to the beaver, Castoridae. It's closely related to Skyridae, which is not all that exciting. And of course, it's famous for the fact that uh, it's only found. It's one of the only two families that's the Arctic endemic, and specifically. It's up in the Pacific Northwest. Okay. And so, and the Cascade Mountain Range is primarily. Only one species in a whole bunch, and we got one head. I got one skull. Okay. So, the next one, it, most of these are going to be pretty easy for you because we, we've, we've been beating these to death in lab. All that Castority, right there. North American beaver, we know it's the species, Castor canadensis. It's in the Arctic, and all of that, okay? This is Caviety, okay? It's really not Caviety, but, okay? They changed the name to this, to Hybrocerity. I don't care. It's a hard name to remember. The, the genus of Capybara is Cavia, so I see no reason for us to have to change this, because we're not, none of us are gonna be studying Capybara or doing anything with them lifetimes here, you know, once, once Lend is over, we don't care about them anymore, so anyway. But, it now it, it contains capybara, but this is where the guinea pigs are in this group too. Guinea pigs are an interesting animal uh, in terms of ecology. They're one of the few rodents that brought to this country that never became an invasive species. They never bother anybody. It's just, you know, sometimes introductions are kind of nice. They just, they're very, very commensal. They stay with humans. And they're cute and you can eat them too. So there is all these caviety, neotropical, and yeah. Okay, now we're getting into the big groups. Chrysididae, as I mentioned before, Chrysididae are known as the New World Mice and Rats. I put that in quotations because they are found in, the Old World generally refers to the Paleoarctic and the Afrotropical. The new world refers to the to the neotropical and uh, the Neartic. Uh, they're found in all those locations. Okay. See, so again, the native range: Neartic, Neotropical, but also Paleartic and into the indo -Malay. This, they're number two in terms of the largest families in the world. So you know, the beardy is going to be number. Uh, all of them have the same dental formula. They have no, we know that they have no canines, but 
but they also don't have any premolars either. Instead, they've got three molars. So it's really easy number, 1003, which is easy for me to remember because that's October 3rd, which is my anniversary. Ah, isn't that cute? Okay, I always remember that. Whenever you're dealing with a group this huge, you know you're gonna have to add additional taxa in the groups. And so this has some subfamilies. And I'm not gonna make you learn the exact, the NA terms for the subfamilies. Just wanna let you know who's in the different groups. Voles, lemmings, and muskrat make up one of these groups all together here. Uh, voles, if you ever hear people talk about a field mouse, it's not a mouse, it's a vole. This is what a vole looks like here. Voles, they look very much like, well, if you think about a mouse, think about big ears and a long tail. Voles, no, they have small ears and a very short tail. And a lot of people, this is the image you have of mice. There's a lot of voles in the world. For some reason, they don't get the high billing that mice get. Lemmings, we've heard about. What do you know about lemmings? Anything? I know something that's not true about them. Thank you. That's what I wanted to do. As long as, is, isn't it amazing that we know nothing about lemmings except the men? Thanks to <coughs> Disney caused that one. We knew that. They're the ones that made up the fake uh, documentary of lemmings going out the cliff. So, and then, of course, muskrat. The voles, I do want you to know this genus, they are microtus. That's an important genus. It's a big group. Uh, and that's one. Again, especially those of you that are going into either some sort of work dealing with conservation or uh, marsh rec or anything, microtes, even the microtenes, as we call them for short, you're going to run into them a lot. Muskrat, we've already had. Odontra, Sabithicus. And I don't really care if you know anything about the lemmings. Okay, so, so this group, voles, lemmings, and muskrat are one of the three. The next one are known as the neotenine mice and rats. Who are these guys? Okay. Well, another big uh, rodent we have around here is called the wood rat. And again, it's not, well, we have a tendency to put bad connotations on rats the way they hear the name rat. It's, it's, it's like a big mouse, this one here. Neotoma, so that's the one to know. Neotoma florans, Neotoma subflavians, a few others. And then these guys, these are some of my favorite. These one, when people think of mice, this is another one they tend to think about, is the group Paramiscus. And there are two, Paramiscus leucopus, the white-footed mouse, and Paramiscus maniculatus, the deer mouse. They look very, very much alike. Uh, the only way you can really tell them apart is look at the, the rear leg length. Leucopus, the white-footed mouse, has a bigger foot. So that makes it, uh, I always remember it as the wide-footed mouse, and that's how I, even though it's longer, not wide, that's why I keep these apart. Paramiscus leucopus, paramiscus manipulatus, or a couple of you may know they're around here a lot. The last group then, so, so the neotamine mice and rats, are the sigmodon mice and rats. And this is another big group around here, cotton rats. Uh, this is what the cotton rat, sigmodon looks like here, cotton rat. Okay. All right, so that's, now, so crescidity is a big group. We got a lot of them around here. I don't care what you've heard, these we ain't got, okay? Every now and then I'll have somebody call me and say, I saw a dead porcupine on the road. And the, what's the proper response to that? No, you didn't, okay. Okay, see, so uh, erythrocytony are the new world porcupines. So they are, they are neotropic, uh, neo okay? And everybody knows about them, uh, their hairs, have been modified to be very, very sharp, barbed quills. They don't shoot them out. That's, a, that's another one of the myths. But they come loose pretty easily if you were to touch them, or if you're a stupid dog and you bite one of these things, uh, you're gonna get a face full of them. Uh, the Arctic, and there's some neotropical. This is one of the animals that made the cross. But now you don't find it in between. It's not found in southeastern United States. We don't have them here. They're not in Tennessee. So, again, there's some evidence there were at one time. Well, they had to have been at one time. I mean, how'd they get from South America to upper end of North America? They had to come through here sometime. And 
they're not here now. Here's another one, a, a family we mentioned very, very early on in this class because this family is just weird as anything. This is heterocephality, which means different sized heads. What heterocephality means. This is the naked mole rat. And it's only Afrotropical. Uh, and this is the one that it's, it's, it defies all rules for a mammal. It, does, it, it acts much more like an insect than it does a mammal. Okay. So as a result, so a lot of work is done with this. Uh, physiological research is done with it. Behavioral research is done with it. Ecological research is always some sort of question, you know, you know, people say, well, I, this, this, this is happening. Well, what about the naked mole rat? Okay, well, it's something totally different. Okay. So in this way, they have a, a very, very similar to what we see in, in bee populations. There's only one breeder. She's the queen. All the rest of them are sterile and can't reproduce. So the queen keeps producing all the ones, and she, of course, is taken care of by the workers. Physiologically, these things have amazing, very, very, very low metabolic rates. We talked about this before when we were talking about metabolism. They don't need much oxygen whatsoever, so they can live in these deep burrows and everything's fine and dandy. Uh, they are, to some extent, thermal conformers. It's very easy for them to be a thermal conformer. They live in a warm environment, so it's not hard to, to find that, to, to be that way. Okay. The other thing is that at I, I'm glad, and I don't really want to know the experiments that were done to find this out, but they are supposedly have very, very high pain tolerances. One thing. What I am more interested in is another thing about them is they, the carcinogens don't seem to bother them. They don't develop cancer very well. That's kind of important. And here you got a rodent that's can, and some of these things can live in excess of 30 years. They're, well, if you think about big animals, which you expect to have a longer life cycle, deer, cows, they don't live anywhere near close to 30 years. So this is sort of an interesting, very, very interesting animal. Only one species in the world, we've already talked about the name, is still Heterocephalus glaber. So it's been on your list for ever in the day. Okay, the next group, this is one who is in this region here, or in the southeastern United States, I should say, Geomyidae. This is called the pocket gopher. It gets its name because basically, when you look at this here, you don't realize it, but its mouth is closed. Right? Its teeth come out, and it basically has this furry pocket behind its teeth. So uh, they, that's what gives it the same pocket filter. Okay. So large fur-lined cheek pouch that it used to carry food. Okay. And so it's neotropical and the Arctic. And it's very big in the southeastern part of the United States. They are burrowers. So they dig lots and lots of burrows. And for those of you who, uh, I know a couple of you here are conservation background and all that. One of the, and you may have heard of, a, of an endangered snake in the southeast of the United States called the pine snake, Louisiana pine snakes, okay. Pitchiophus. Pitchiophus are highly dependent on these guys. They, they use their burrows. Snakes don't make their own burrows. They don't have little shovels. They don't make, they use burrows of other animals. And uh, the pocket gophers provide the burrows for them. They also provide the, the burrows for the, the for, there's a tortoise that was down here that's also uh, endangered, and they do the same thing for that. So, so they're kind of an important animal. Okay. Heteromyidae, okay. uh, Maya, by the way, means, of course, means mouse. That's why you've seen it over and over again in these names. Uh, not around here, but they are in, in the Neotropic, they are in the Neotropic region. Uh, these are the kangaroo mice and the pocket mice. Okay. So where you find them, these are desert animals. You can see this one here. Uh, and, uh, and they move into, into northern South America. So neotropical and the Arctic. Uh, 
being a desert animal, what's problem number one if you're a desert animal? It's water. These guys don't drink water, ever. In fact, uh, which is kind of a sad story right here, to them, water is toxic. And I bring this up there. So needless to say, they're a, a model species for research. And there was a research lab in southwestern United States that had a bunch of these in there. PETA broke into it and felt that they were being mistreated, so they gave them all water. Killed them all. So, kind of interesting thing. so how do they live? They live by water of metabolism. Okay. What that is, is when you break down your food, uh, it, part of the process of breaking down food produces water. And that's all the water they need by which to live. Okay. Uh, this is a new term I wanted to... I, I, these are a saltatory animal. That has nothing to do with salt. Okay. It means they're jumpers. Okay. And so basically, they, they, when they jump, they're kind of cool. They get, they get the name kangaroo. I mean, it's, it's obvious how they get the name. They've got this, they basically, they jump on their back legs, their front legs stay up, and of course they use their tail for balance. Too, so they move just like a kangaroo would move. Okay. So yeah, basically I've talked about all this sort of stuff already. They're, they're built for desert life. They estivate. Uh, their urine is highly concentrated. So they put out pretty close to just uric acid all. Okay, so this is our this is a local resident now of, of around here, and there's a lot of them around here right now. This is Nutria, so uh, they this is another one that's now got a new family name. We're not going to use it. We're going to stick with the old family name because it's easier to remember. Uh, my, and why don't I change some of these names? Because it'll be a million years before people around here start calling this Echinomyidae. It's just like we still have it. We people are still talking about the group Insectivora around here, and that's been changed in the 40s. So, uh, so there's no real reason for me to give you a whole bunch of new names. Okay, so Maya Castori, and that way we don't have to learn the family at all. So, originally of tropical, now it's an invasive. <coughs> okay. And the only species I want you to know, of course, is that you already have Mount Castorcorpo with nutrients. Here's one we all know and love, furry tail rats. Skyiridae, and Skyiridae, of course, are the squirrels. And you can break the squirrels into two really big groups. So where do you find them? Of course, these are, are pretty much cosmopolitan. Uh, in Europe, uh, they have red squirrels. There, of course, in Europe, this squirrel here, the gray squirrel, is an invasive species now, They're causing all kinds of troubles, especially in the United Kingdom. Uh, the gray squirrels are outcompeting the red squirrels. So there's a real problem there with them. Okay. Okay. Squirrels might be a little bit different in the fact that they do have a free moment. So, so they're, they're October 13th and now October 3rd. So different groups we break them into. First of all, they're the tree squirrels. And so those are the ones we're more familiar with. We think of tree squirrels, we think of gray squirrels and fox squirrels, and that's what we usually think of. There's gray, Skyiris carolinensis, and the fox squirrel is Skyiris niger. Another one, is, oh, we'll get to the ground squirrels next. Okay, So <coughs> the big ground squirrel that around here is Marmota monax. Groundhogs. Again, where I was when I was up in Pennsylvania, there was a lot of groundhogs, which I'm sure we're calling. So, so they were posing rather nicely for me. <coughs> and another ground squirrel is the eastern chipmunk, Camius striatus, no, striatus rather, Camius striatus, and then. This one here, I don't want you to know. Okay, don't worry about learning the 13-line ground squirrel. I mean, 
mostly because the name has changed. And I remember early on showing this to you and giving its new name. This is its old name. And I don't want to make your heads melt. So I will never ask you any questions about the 13 line route. Plus, we don't even have it around here. I always liked it because uh, it's, it's, this is more northern animal in, up into Illinois, Iowa type areas. And I used to see them all the time when I was up there. But they're not that big around here. But they it did have this neat name because it's a 13 line ground squirrel. We don't have that anymore. Pretty picture. Thank you. Okay, and then this is Glaucomis volans. Didn't take this picture. Uh, uh, Southern flying squirrel. Anyone ever seen these things? Are they rare? Well, they're as common as can be. There's some estimates that there are more flying squirrels than there are uh, fox squirrels. You can see, talk about an animal that's built for the night. Every now and then I'll get them on game cameras. You'll see one fly by, not fly, glide by on a game camera or something like that. There are a lot of them because they're nocturnal, you can't see them. If you ever want to try to see one, if you're walking through the woods and you find a dead hollow tree, what you do is take a big stick and hammer the snot out of it. Every now and then you get one to jump out of the top. I've done it once or twice. Of course, but remember, what about dead hollow trees in the woods? What do we know about them? A lot of animals like what to is? use them. What? What do we call them? Have you ever heard, heard the term widowmaker? Yeah. It's their own. So be careful. I always, it's, it's, I lost a good friend that way. So there's a very, very close problem with me. It's, it's the, the Widowmaker came down. So, uh, so be careful of the woods. He said, be careful. Okay. All right. Now the last, the biggest, the monsters, the ones that we, the rodents you love to hate. Meridae. These are the old world mice and rats. There's a huge diversity of these. Okay, again, Paleoarctic primarily. This is basically, this is why, so, so oh, they truly are old world originally. And so the Chrysididae got called new world by default, even though they're not just new world. So this, this is sort of the reason why they got named old world and new world. These guys, originally were Paleoarctic, Indo-Malay, Afrotropical. Now though, they're everywhere, specifically because of two, if not three, house mouse and black rat are pretty much everywhere. We'll be talking a lot about them. So it's the largest of all family of mammals, approximately 800 species. Sometimes you'll see it and it'll say, thus is the largest of all family species, approximately 1,400 species. That's, that's old data. That's back when chrysidids were still old. In them. So it's, it's, it's kind of hard to be reading. You'll see all sorts of different numbers. And you have to realize that sometimes people are just copying what they shouldn't be copying. Their dental formula varies. So they can be, they can be uh, again, they don't have any premolars. They only have molars. But it can vary from anywhere from one, two, to three premolars. Uh, and that's probably not all that important for you all to know. The only murid head that I want you to know is Rattus rattus, or I guess it's Rattus norvegicus. And that one you would sight identify it anyway. And mostly, if you remember from, so I already had it on test, it has the one that has the two uh, little rodent heads with the two uh, carina or ridges run down each side. Common names that you need to know, genera and or species that you need to know, okay? So this, by the way, this one here, this, you've all heard of gerbils. Okay, everybody, I had a pet gerbil. They did this with this pet gerbil, that with this pet gerbil. It's actually the Mongolian gerbil. There are lots of gerbils in the world. Uh, and so Mongolian gerbil is a common pet. I do want you to know that one. Uh, but you don't need to know the scientific name of the cup. I do want you to know the commensals. These are the ones that live with humans, and these are pest species. These are a big problem. First is this one. This is mus musculus. 
If you have mice in your house, this is it. Mouse, mouse, mouse. Unless you live out in the woods and some stupid paramiscus decided to get into your house, which they'll do that too. It's generally as mus musculus, you can tell that. Next one is rat, ratus ratus. And then the third one is ratus norvegicus. So those, of course, we don't call them by those. Those are their uh, scientific names. And I'm going to, what the rest of this lecture I want to talk about is basically how did, how do we manage for these things? Because we, they, these are not good animals. These are not your friend. Unless you begin doing research. Some aspects of, of, of being as pet species. Okay, first of all, pet species are commensalists. They live close to you. Anything that's a pet species is somehow living in, in connection with humans. Okay. Another thing about uh, uh, pet species is they tend to have high reproductive rates in general. I'm not, and I'm not just talking about mammals here. This is, this is across the board for all pet species. Just give you some, what, what, what do you have to do to be a pet species? Oftentimes, they tend to be primarily vesperal uh, uh, crepuscular. What does that mean? Anybody know what it means to be vesperal crepuscular? Okay. All right, what it means, okay. So, what, if an animal is active at night, what do we call it? Nocturnal. If an animal is active in the day, what do we call it? Diurnal. If an animal is active in the twilight periods between Night and day, we call it crepuscular. crepuscular. But there's two periods. You got morning crepuscular and evening crepuscular. <coughs> morning crepuscular is called auroral crepuscular. Evening is vesperal. Vespers. I'm getting all religious up in here today. And vespers are evening church service. Okay. So some of the other things they do, uh, focusing just on these guys, aspects about them, what makes this aspects of these pet species makes them different than the other rodents, uh, is of course they they do a lot of gnawing on commensalist type stuff. So they're not out gnawing on a bone, on a sign on a tree. They're in the house gnawing on wires, you know, all sorts of problems here. You deal with that. Okay. Uh, another thing about them is once they're in, the, they they are creatures of habit. So they'll basically they develop these trails <coughs> and they establish them. And the trails are are always next to the walls. So you're never going to they, they stay close to walls. And that's kind of an important thing to remember when trying to catch these guys and deal with this. This is a good example when I go on the wall. That's right. How you identify them? Okay. An adult mouse, they can be anywhere from one to four inches in size, and still be an adult or a young adult. So, so they're not very big. Okay. Rats can be up to eight inches, and sometimes have a tail that is longer than their body. So, how do you tell a young house? How, how do you tell a full-grown house mouse from a young rat? Uh, some of the differences, this is the house mouse here. Here's my rat up here, this picture here. One is the feet, okay? Rats have big feet, mice have little feet. The other is the head. Rats have big heads, mice have little heads. You could, this is basic, you know, to me, they're, I see, when I see a, mouse, a rat, I, I, I'm seeing the jaw. Obviously, they have a much bigger jaw than, than, on, a, than on a mouse. Another important thing, of course, you don't see is you see the scab. You see the feces they leave behind. Mice feces look like black rice grains to me. I always think about that. Rat feces are bigger, much bigger. Yeah, so, yeah, quarters and that size. Okay. okay. Uh, some more common names. Okay, so basically the two rats, Rattus ratus and Rattus norvegicus, because they put them in the other order. Um, these are the, their common names are often black rat and brown rat, but you gotta kind of take that with a grain of salt because there's all sorts of uh, 
Other names for the black rat include roof rat, ship rat, uh, all sorts of names, uh, often referred to as that. The brown rat is often known as, did you notice I had the pictures just flipped up backwards? This is a black rat, <coughs> a brown rat. See, black rats tend to be black, brown rats tend to be more on the brown side. So is that flipped up backwards? But okay, the brown rat is often known as the Norway rat, uh, wharf rat, uh, a few other names like that, okay. Uh, the black rat, yeah, the one we have, uh, the name I hear around here all the time for black rats is roof rat. That's used a lot. We, when I lived in Memphis, we had roof rats. But I had a cat that killed them. It was great. You'd let it go in the attic, and you'd wait a while, you'd hear it, and he'd come down with a, that was my, my cat Norman. He, would, he was hell on roof rats. Okay, how do you tell these guys apart then? Roof rat, Rattus ratus, Norway rat, Rattus norvegicus. Okay. Roof rat, okay. Uh, the tail is always longer than the body, and they tend to be they tend to be more I call it demure, more slim, li the, the littler of the two rats. Okay. They got really big eyes, and the nose is pointy. To me, <coughs> roof rats look like really overgrown mice. So I usually tell them apart. Big eyes, big ears, pointy nose. Norway rat, and this, of course, this is the one. This, this is the one you're going to find in the dumps or anything else, the garbage on the streets. Uh, its its tail is not as long as its head and body. Its body is thick, again, and uh, small eyes, small ears, and a very blunt nose. The uh, roof rats tend to have uh, very smooth in nature, and the, the Norway rats, because they have a lot of guard hairs, like these extra long hairs that come off, they tend to look kind of, kind of disheveled. These guys, roof rats get their names, because that's where you're gonna find them. They have high nesters and trees and in attics, and uh, Norway rats are going to be in the walls in the basement. So basically, they, they partition their habitat. <coughs> okay, now I want to compare this. Rats and mice don't act alike. There's some differences between them. Okay, now rats are, okay, so basically, rats, when we think about them, they don't need a very big hole to get into. They're very good at squeezing their bodies down. So. A half inch crack, and that's not very big. Well, let a big old rat could get through that. Okay. The other thing about rats is they are very, very cautious. Okay. This is all. This all feeds into uh, important uh, to know about uh, when, when dealing with them. They don't like change, and, they, and they've got so they're always going to be conscious of that. They don't need a whole lot of food a day. Two and a half ounces of food. Time. And they don't need much water either in a day. Compare that to mice. Mice can get through even smaller holes, which makes sense. Mice are not cautious. Mice are curious. Mice are famous for what's up with that. And they go check things out all the time. Uh, eat very, very little food. And don't, really, they can go days without drinking water. Okay, so again, this is going to change. This is going to change behavior. My rats have got to get to water somehow. These guys, not so important. That's what, yeah. Well, that's it. And these guys don't travel much. They used to stay pretty close to where they first nested. 10 yards, so it's not, not too far. Not that. Okay. I'm going to stop there and we'll start with signs of pest groups when we get back in here.